Hello, this is Al Caso. Uh, it's September 11th, 2008. We're in Mountain View, California. This is tape number one of an interview with Fran Allen. Thanks for stopping by. Well, I'm delighted to be here. So is this the first time that you've been to the museum since it's moved? Oh, no. I've, I've been here for a couple of events. Oh, okay. And, uh, and, uh, and a visit came here uh, soon after you got the stretch machine. Uh, I think you came down it was from Liv the Livermore. Machine, the Livermore machine. Yeah. Liv the Livermore machine, mm -hmm. and uh, and didn't didn't know that it had been moved here, and was so delighted <laughs> when I, when I walked into the the um, room and there it was. It was, a it was in in the big storage room in, in Moffat, all the cabinets packed together. No, it was actually lined up on the, in the time in the in the room of machines oh. with and. With the t with the where that was, I guess the uh, ordered by date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's when I saw it. So there was a, a nice oral history that Paul Eswitz did with you in 2003. So what I wanted to do was just start out with what's happened since 2003. I know there was the Turing Award and just what you've been up to in the last five years. Ah. <laughs> Well, we, I, to, by t I retired from IBM in 2002 mm -hmm. uh, after 45 years with the company uh, and retired just because I wanted to manage my own schedule. <laughs> and, um, but I had a, a, um, an arrangement with IBM. I'm a, re a fellow in my uh, emeritus position. And uh, I still have at IBM Research my the office I had before I retired, and a lot of my papers are there. I go in pretty often. And uh, so that's one of the things I do, but mm -hmm. winning the Turing Award really has changed my life. I've uh, gotten uh, invitations from around the world to come and to, to give talks about uh, the, the work I had done, and, uh, and I've been thoroughly enjoying that. Mostly it's from universities, it's from companies, uh, and, uh, and I talk about a lot about the history of, uh, of computing because I started in 1957. So when I trace my own history uh, and from when I first started and, uh, and, and then um, and, and relate what I, my own experience is to pretty much to where we are today. I mean, it's not a definitive history, it's my history. Mm -hmm. and it's, but it is technical, I really. That's what I've been spending my time on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so have there been any particular events then that you remember in, in, in specifics of the last couple of years? Or? Well, the Turing Award event, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> receiving and the that, <laughs> and the, the lecture. Uh, and it's, um, I, the lecture I uh, am giving now uh, is evol evolved since then because there's been some new technical issues that have come up that I've become quite interested in, something called multi-cores, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the parallelism that uh, is becoming uh, the way that we're going to get performance, mm -hmm. uh, software parallelism. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of been uh, looking into that and uh, attending a lot of lectures, learning a lot about that, and relating it back to um, what uh, I understand about that partic uh, particular topic um, to, from the experiences I've had with uh, high performance computing, which is where I spent my in, uh, career on mm -hmm. compiling and um, languages for high, high performance computers. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was just your opinions on what's going on with uh, the, the potential for thousands of cores on a on a processor chip and just uh, how we're going to deal with that from a software perspective. <laughs> I have a whole lecture on it, but, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's, an ama it's, a, it's a, going to be extraordinarily challenging. Um, it was, um, there was, I attended a little workshop recently on the 50 billion transistor chip, mm -hmm. and that's going to come and uh, how those transistors will uh, be used, oh, how many thousands of uh, them will be p little processors, how they'll be used 
for storage on chip on the same chip um, is is, un, is unknown, but it's software in all of our, all of our software has got to play a very much bigger role, and um, it's going to be it's the biggest challenge that we have, and uh, and I think I mean. A lot of people are calling it a challenge, particularly John Hennessy had a statement that, uh, that it's the biggest challenge computer science has ever faced. But, uh, and, and, but my view, and I entirely agree with John, but my view is that it's also the biggest opportunity we'll ever get <laughs> to actually reset a lot of the, of, uh, the way computers uh, are used and what their role is in society. It's kind of an, an interesting time. It's, a, it's an inflection point for computing, and everything is going to change. Mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of good reasons for why it should change. We, we're not, uh, we've grown up fast in computing. It's used everywhere. It's, used, it's pervasive, but it's still pretty immature in a lot of, of, um, of um, its, uh, the way we interface with computing, and uh, and 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 with the um, with how robust the computing systems are. Mm -hmm. So, do you do you think that these systems will will stick with a, a von Neumann model, or or just because of the the number of transistors that are available that we can move away from that to to data flow models or? Well, I think there'll be multiple models, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and and it'll very much depend upon the applications. But I I, th I think we don't understand the models themselves very very much, uh, and uh, so I think there will be data flow models. There be there are streaming models, there there are transactional models that are being looked at very closely for for, for as a way of uh, solving some of the problems. And then there's the traditional models that we've had. For computations, and I think that the that we, what we're, we'll see over the next quite a few years is an evolution going on uh, uh, in in understanding models in uh, of all sorts and how to put them together and have them effective. Uh, be, one of the things I think we're, the other thing that's happening at this particular point, other than the just the the number of transistors on a, on a chip and the fact that we're going to, that we have to, each, each one is going to have to be um, prob probably l less capable because of the heat problems of, of the miniature come out that comes up as a result of the miniaturization that's been going on and the fact that we have put a lot of capabilities on one of the, on chips which gets to using up a lot of energy and that's going to go away. But the physical thing there is is not is 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 one thing that's uh, issue that's going to be driving what happens, but the but another issue is that we have um, it is the is that we've brought together a capability built out of many 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 separate capabilities. Computing grew up with computers. You know, computational capabilities separate from communicating com communications, uh, and 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 separate in separate separate pieces, and it's all been being integrated into one commodity, and uh, and and it, the integration is still a very awkward, mm -hmm. and. And I think that that's as big a challenge as the kind of multi-core thing, is mm -hmm. the, how do we in, integrate um, these very separate capabilities? Mm -hmm. and, so uh, that, that sort of gets into um, system complexity and programming paradigms. And just, you know, yes. How, how do we... How do, yeah, how do, we, how, do we, how do we do that? And how do we overcome... Um, We've got a lot of problems right now. The massive amounts of data that are out available, and how do we manage that data? How do we? It's it, how do we, um, in, in some cases, eliminate some of that information? Or it's 
I, and that's not my area of expertise, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's uh, I think, quite an overwhelming, uh, mm -hmm. wh which, how the growth of the future will evolve unless we have answers to some of the problems of, of how we communicate and manage data, right? So the, the raw data problem gets back to harvest and alpha and the work yeah. that, so that uh, you were working on this in the early 60s. The, the, the harvest system is really unique at that time for the amount of hardware that they threw at the problem of pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just, so the, uh, one of the things I've been curious about is, is just what the software system was like and uh, did, did NSA specify what, what the harvest box was to look like or, or how, did, how did that evolve, the, the hardware and software that, that NSA wanted for, for cryptanalysis and, and uh, uh, pattern recognition? Well, that was um, the the hard uh, the the hard. Maybe I should mention a little bit about the harvest was a was actually two, was built was associated with the stretch machine, mm -hmm. which was being built um, for Los Alamos and from some of the Grand Challenge problems of the of the time, mm -hmm. and. Uh, in which was a more standard machine, though it was, who, who was breaking. It was a huge amount of thing, n number of things had to be invented for it to work. Mm -hmm. um, but stretch was an uh, harvest was an entirely different attachment, and there were two parts to harvest. Uh, it was the 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 part that the, the piece of hardware that that did the analysis, and that. Um, and that consisted, that had seven instructions, eight, nine instructions, actually eight functional instructions. And any one of those, and it was, it was looking for patterns in data. And, and any instruction could run for days. And it was coded, it was, uh, that was programmed at a kind of a, a, um, a um, micro level. And the, 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 it, would, it was like setting up timing, timings in the instructions, and so things, these bytes of data would, would pass by an instruction and through, you know, doing comparisons and collecting up uh, da data and, 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 um, and, and some of the, one of the, that would be one sort of set of instructions. Another set of instructions were in the, for harvest were, were, was an instruction for sort. And uh, and uh, and so they were they were um, just very different than the kinds of instructions that we think of in a, n a normal um, arithmetic unit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was and this was operating on billions of characters because billions of the tractor. Of characters. Yeah. And that's where what was one of the most amazing parts of it was that there the the I O of the time was pretty primitive, but there was a track there was a a system that was called the tractor tape. And I had, I've, I think I've got that information with me, but is uh, the, the um, um, let me back up a little bit here. Uh, it, what, this was during the Cold War. And, uh, and the main thing that, uh, that Harvest was built, ho built for was to analyze data from listening stations around the world, and uh, and it and it could um, it it could um, so the I, I, let me look up let me look up here. What so the, was, was it was it voice traffic or teletype traffic or just what sorts of? Um, what, um, I'm not quite sure what it what it oh, was yeah. because I wasn't mm -hmm. associated with that end mm -hmm. of it. Um, let's see, I, I have somewhere here a uh, yeah. There was a uh, in Paul's oral history. You, you mentioned that the the machine wasn't actually in the fort when you were working on it. it What's was, that? It was off off of the base when you were working on it. Oh, it was initially. in the basement. No, it was in it was in Fort Meade. Oh, it was yeah. it was on the, on the fort. Right. Oh. Right. Um, yeah. So there was a, a there was a um, a, ta a tape system 
where, uh, which, uh, on which this, this was stored, and, it, and um, which had a ca capacity for, well, 3.3 <laughs> uh, million bytes per second. Doesn't sound like a lot. But, uh, and, but, the, but the most interesting part of the whole system was the fact that the, 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 the data transfer rate to and from the ta these tapes through the, the storage of Harvest Stretch through, and then from there through the, uh, the Harvest Analyzer were, were, were completely in sync. So data could flow off a tape and, or off the whole tape system uh, and through the memory, through the analysis and, and information recorded back on the tapes about what was found uh, without any s stopping and doing, actually doing I.O. Mm -hmm. or doing loading. Mm -hmm. It just it set up the system and it would just, it would, it would run and could run for hours and days. Uh, and, and there were enough tape units that it would just stream across the tapes and the yes. operators would mount the... <laughs> no, the, oper that was, it, the operators, those tapes were never touched. Oh. Um, so it was, there was early, a it big was an cartridge system. It was a great, a giant cartridge system mm -hmm. with, with and, and they would, where they had ad addresses about the, the tapes had addresses and, and were, were automatically pulled, it was programmed to be, pull up a tape, bring it up to a reader mm -hmm. and, and uh, then take it off, and then um, read it. Mm -hmm. But the, f the f I think it's the only it's the only system that has ever been built um, um, that had the I/O, the memory, and the analysis unit. Uh, in in in, uh, it, it wasn't. I don't. I I think it think of it as being on the same clock, but it, they were completely in sync, mm -hmm. and that was designed by. Um, uh, that that's that that piece of it was designed by a man named Jim Pomerine, who is still uh, he's, he's thankfully still around and doing well, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and he had done uh, was the engineer on John von Neumann's machine and was hired by IBM for this project and uh, had a long relationship well for the rest of his life, uh, rest of his career. Uh, with um, NSA mm. uh, liaison be with, with between uh, uh, NSA and IBM. Mm -hmm. So, so was the the operating system um, on on the Stretch Harvest system an extension of MCP, or was it completely unique to? It was uh, it, it was a it was something it was called Hops. Mm -hmm. It was kind of built on to, uh, Harvest operating system. And it was built. To, it was built to be some, uh, compatible with the stretch, with the MC, mm -hmm. MCP, I guess it mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Now, but Alpha was the language, uh, the high-level language, that the um, the cook, the anal analyst at NSA would would write their programs in. And that mm -hmm. was the way that was. I was involved with with the stretch harvest compiler, mm -hmm. and uh, and with was the liaison between with, between IBM and the analyst at, uh, at NSA mm -hmm. uh, on the design of that language. And, uh, though so, I d knew so how did how did how did Alpha end up being designed? Did they give you a set of requirements and then you you tried to match it to the hardware? Or? It was actually it was it was designed to the to to match the hardware mm -hmm. basically uh, and match their problem and uh, and it was a very high level language. And in 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 one in which they could very succinctly describe what the the pro the problem itself, but it also and it could they could do that in part because uh, translating that language in, by the compiler to the machine was pretty much straightforward, but but because the whole system had been designed to, uh, to solve this one problem. And, uh, so, and so was there a pretty close correspondence between the instructions in the language and the instructions on the machine or I uh, pretty yes it was a pretty st straightforward mapping oh, okay. of, of, of so that. let's so let's say you were gonna you were gonna do a keyword search for foo in a data stream 
how would you do that? Uh, well, what, what that would be, there would be, uh, foo would be considered like one, one data stream, or, you know, data stream that, didn't, that just was held. And then you would, there was an, one instruction called stream byte byte byte, and, uh, which always took as input two data streams, and, or one of them could be fixed, and mm -hmm. foo would be fixed. And then, and then it would be, and the streaming then was ma would be managed by the, you, 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 the how how the ma the mapping, how the the the, the uh, comparisons were done, uh, was expressed, say in in forms of of how many k bytes you want to look at at a time, you know eight bytes at a time, mm -hmm. ten bytes at a time. Or yeah, something. so I'm just trying to get a feeling as a as a programmer what it would have been like to use alpha oh it was it was well i i um, uh, when in giving the, preparing for the talk i gave here a few years ago on on alpha it was um i um, <coughs> wrote a little a little program in alpha so, and uh, for to do uh, 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 oh Mapping the uh, DNA mapping and looking for patterns in in, in DNA uh, mapping and I think I had about sixteen or eighteen lines of code. I mean, it really was very very trivial to do that in in, in order to do a complete map. Of, uh, and, uh, and so it was, it was so straightforward. Uh, so was oh it, and was oh one other thing I have to tell you about alpha the data. The, the the data itself, of course, was was the sources of the data were were in the, uh, had from these listening stations around around the world, and it wasn't just these in the Cyrillic alphabet. It could be in any alphabet. So one ha had built into the language into the system was a way of in total system was a way of mapping a, a language to to numbers, so you could, and you could actually specify that in the alpha language. This is the Cyrillic alphabet, and and and, and uh, not in the terms of how what the alphabet looked like, but if you saw this number, that and it was the the the, the ordering, symbol, the symbol mappings. Yeah, the symbol mappings, and then uh, and then that that was what was 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 used. Uh, you, so you could specify the. Uh, chi, I, Supposedly a, Chi and a, the, uh, a Chinese alphabet, but uh, I don't know how that worked. But it, but certainly the other alphabets, uh, all sorts, could be specified in the line, in the program uh, uh, as to what what kind of data it was and what the ordering was. And we had to had to introduce two special, um, uh, in addition to the the members of the alphabet. We, we introduced uh, something called a pad and a scab. <laughs> a scab was was when it, when it was a, uh, unreadable uh, when you had bad data, and a pad was was for in between pieces of data, so chunks of data. So you'd have words that would be divide, split by pads, but you by blanks essentially, and uh, and and also might contain a lot of dirty data. And uh, and that was part of what the whole the system would work on, is recognizing it was since it was statistically based, uh, working on on uh, filtering out the uh, bad data as well, mm -hmm. because from those listening stations there was a lot of it. Now I, as even though I had a high c clearance, I didn't uh, know anything about how the about it. The, a lot of these details until much much later, mm -hmm. but I did what one of the one of part of what I uh, had to do as a la the the liaison and uh, and building the in, in the bring up of the compiler and the harvest machine for that the, for the alpha uh, system was to also write uh, the final re the acceptance test for the for the alpha language. Mm -hmm. And I, that was one, once I knew that I couldn't leave uh, Fort Myers until I had that, that that was done, and I dreaded it for oh, the whole year I was there. 
uh, and uh, but in the acceptance, the acceptance test was to be uh, an auto automatically abstracting uh, Time magazine articles because that's it, you know the kind of the analog of what the the real problem was about, mm -hmm. and uh, and at the so was it was it keyword strings or yeah oh, okay uh -huh. so that's it's and so I got the out of the method from some one of my colleagues about the and uh, and did it and it wrote again it was just a few lines of alpha code uh, and uh, and it worked. And it was, it was like I, I was expecting to spend an, another month at, in the basement of Fort Meade. Mm -hmm. uh, and instead, you know, the second or third time around, it, it, it produced a wonderful abstract of these articles. Mm -hmm. So, so how, many, how many software people at IBM ended up working on Alpha and the, and the compiler side of the system? Well, the, the team... Um, it's a little hard to break it all down, uh -huh. but the the actual bring up team, team, the team that was down in Fort Meade, assigned to Fort Meade, which f for uh, w w consisted of about uh, I think there were ten of us, um, and uh, uh, but and that covered the operating systems uh, as well as the compiler. And um, and some you know some other problems. Yeah, issues. One, of, one of the things I was I was wondering about is this is an early example of data mining. Is did any of this knowledge make it out? Nothing made it yeah. out. Not even my final report, yeah. which I forgot to make a copy of <laughs> before it, it 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 was stamped. Uh, confident. Yeah. <laughs> I, it yeah. just, so you know, all, just all of this knowledge that just yeah went no nowhere. it just, just just went down but but that's all been declassified now mm -hmm. all of that has pretty much all of that has been declassified and uh, and uh, but so as, as far as you know none of the people that worked on this did any further work no, and no we all yeah. right, right that's a shame yeah but but our, our work but it was such an unusual system too I mean there were there weren't many. Um, uh, because it had the track, the tractor t system, the, that piece, and uh, and the um, you know the big date that and the big piece of hardware that was a hard piece of hardware that was much larger than stretch, and uh, you just in physical size, and a very very unusual piece of hardware, and uh, and uh, also you know. The alpha language and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so then from the I guess this would have been sixty four, sixty five. You started working on ACS. Uh, it, what what I did from after that, I after coming back, and in, in so the, the acceptance was in sixty two. Sixty three, I think 63? it ended up. Okay. Yeah. Right. So then ACS started to ramp up in sixty four, yeah. sixty five. Right. Yeah, it was in, in, in 63 I came back from that, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In fact, I was down in, in the, I went, it was in the Bay of, the um, Cuban Missile Crisis was in the fall of 62. And um, that's when I was down there. I was in, and, uh, and it was a, almost a year later that I came back. Was, you know, returned. Right. That was an interesting day at Fort Meade. <laughs> Is there anything you can say about it? Or did just everything got locked down? Or? Well, I would, it, I walked, when I walked into work in that, that morning, it was into Fort Meade that morning. And of course, it's always, it is an interesting place to be because there, there are, you can't get, one couldn't get to the machine room without passing pairs of, not just on that day, uh, pairs of marine, Marines with guns uh, uh, in two or three places, and then, and then, uh, and then, uh, combination hundred-digit combination locks that got changed every once in a while, so to get into the to where the machine was, but uh, so the, but where 
Uh, but on that day, I walked into the building and immediately felt, knew something was wrong. It was just kind of, it, it, was, it was visceral that, and I th that there was something very seriously wrong. And when I went, got to the machine room, um, the, the um, head operator, who was supposed to be on vacation, was there and not talking to anybody. And the, and the printers were all draped in black the, the, because nobody was to see what was being printed. And, so, and it, I, I think it wasn't a, it, there, was a, there was a few hours or maybe a day between the crisis and the, when it was Kennedy and I talked to the people. So, so it was a, it, but it was a, <laughs> interesting to know that something was going on, something very serious. And, uh, and uh, not to know what it was, <laughs> and uh, so, so that, yeah. So, th so then so I came So we made back. it through that. What? <laughs> so we made it through that. <laughs> right, and but but there's a lot. But the the harvest machine was a huge success. I, I'm not wanting to leave that machine for a bit, but mm -hmm. in this interview, it, it, but it was a huge success, and and uh, uh, and and it they eventually. Uh, a, a part of, of, on, for tractor tape was needed, and, and nobody was willing to supply it or something. You know. Anyway, they were very pleased with it. There was mm -hmm. a final report that a man named Snyder wrote, and that's publicly available. I have, have that. And there was a at, at the um, ten year anniversary of the of the system. Um, there was a there was a party down in the machine room, and it involved. <laughs> A, f a small number of people, including but including the, the uh, all the, the heads of IBM were there. You know, uh, Kerry, I think it was, and and some other some others. I mean, that was we were they were our biggest biggest customer for a while. Maybe they still are. I don't know. They and they had every kind of machine in that basement, all partitioned off. There was, a, but usually. Anyway, so when I came back, that's where you had started to mm -hmm. <laughs> ask about. Is when I came back, um, I was 360 was in in uh, the throes of, of uh, 360 being of of uh, being put together, and uh, I was asked to was to join that project. Uh, and that would be, and, and uh, but I decided I didn't want to. It, it involved a lot of travel, and I didn't decide I didn't want to do it. Um, it would involve PO one and some other things. So I, but John Cock um, was in in research and uh, and, and um, was um, and was starting up a new project on the on the, it was called Project System Y at that time. Came, came and uh, and John was interested in in building. Uh, he had been on stra stretch, and um, and he had he was interested in building the uh, the world's uh, fastest computer. And of course, stretch uh, had, was going to be was uh, targeted to be a hundred times faster than mm -hmm. anything uh, any other computer. And John had. Uh, contributed to the hardest part of that, uh, the look ahead unit. And so he was very interested in going ahead with an, the next, uh, the same challenge on a new computer, things we had learned from that. So, mm -hmm. and he asked me to, he asked me to join that project and work, could work on the compiler. And there are three, three or four of us on the compiler there. Mm -hmm. So I went, so returned the, to had, research. Had the 6600 announcement? Been made by then, or was that still in the future? Don't I don't know. Yeah. 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 Just if I think that 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 may have. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it must have been made by that time. Yeah. Come to think of it. Yeah. Anyway, that was another nice project, uh, and uh, a follow-on of, uh, but, but uh, you know, kind of on the on 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 stretch and harvest, we we had. Um, uh, you know, really pushed the envelopes, but we were 
really inventing all the time and under great, uh, 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 great pre uh, deadline pressures because of the, the short delivery uh, requirements. And so it was kind of a, a wonderful time to consolidate, re come up for air, and, and, and we had learned a huge amount of things in, in mm -hmm. all aspects of. Mm -hmm. uh, and circuit technology had moved on, so it was. Yeah, and better the base circuits, technologies you know. had mo moved on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, so this was uh, one of the people driving this was Livermore? Uh, for the. For mm -hmm. ACS. For ACS, not driving it in any mm -hmm. with the way Los Alamos had, had driven stretch. Um, in, in, in Los Alamos was very much embedded in designing of a, a, lot, a lot of the stretch, some, some of stretch, particularly the numerical analysis aspects of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, or the way, of course, uh, uh, for harvest it was it was it was dedicated to NSA, but. Um, but uh, Livermore, we it was not was we worked with Livermore. We also worked some with Los Alamos. It was a good symbio you know, good ar ar arrangement for the kinds of things we wanted to tackle, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, and yeah. I I was working on the worked on the compiler as I said, and then it was it was, that was another wonderful project in the sense that it was the team stayed very small. So we just had started talking about ACS and John Cock and the work out here on the, I guess it was the ACS-1 and then ACS-360. Oh, yes. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. Right. Well, it started as System Y in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, uh, IBM, in IBM Research and, and um, as a, a small group. And uh, then... And, uh, Forgotten what year it was. We and, and I was. In, we built an experimental compiler, uh, which because before the machine to to inform the machine design. So it was. Uh, was it was it a Fortran compiler or it, another? It was a language independent. Mm -hmm. It was the core. The core of the compiler was language independent and um, machine independent because we. We wanted what we wanted to do was to experiment with what the characteristics of the machine were would be, mm -hmm. like number of registers, the number of depth of buffers, all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and it was basically uh, for Fortran like, but it was there was no intent to keep restrain it to Fortran, so it had a, a so the core of the optimi optimizing transform transforming program was designed to be independent of either the language or the uh, and that's uh, or the the target machine and that's where the that piece of work that was the genesis for the piece of work that led to uh, the optimizing uh, com uh, compilers of that nature which continue and in that form is used to, today very widely so the, the, like the Fortran H compiler or uh, can you, any specific IBM compilers you could think of that directly evolved from that? Yes. Um, uh, well, it certainly had a history from from Fortran, the original Fortran, but but uh, the IBM's product compilers today they're called the XL family of compilers, and they and they support this this family um, has a, the core of the optimization and analysis. It is, is supports all of the IBM product languages, from COBOL to mm -hmm. Fortran to. So, so PL. this was the origins of PLC. Or yeah. The Toronto Group. Yes, the Toronto Group, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and and the uh, and, and the uh, it, it went, and and then and and all of IBM's platforms, so. Um, now some of the there's there's a lot of special compilers also, but uh, that's the core uh, high performing performance compiling system, and uh, and it came from and in several uh, incarnations before it got that far and it continues to evolve, evolve, and uh, and and so that came out of the ACS work basically, 
And but it was also that which drew very kind of heavily on the um, on the work we had done on stretch and very directly on the Fortran project originally. So there's a whole hit line of the compiler work has a, a very a long line of uh, where where the, the current system is it goes back long to back us basically yeah. mm -hmm. and through the, this work. So, but then so that was one of the out uh, the pieces of work we did before it moved to uh, became ACS and moved to Cal California. There was a, con a conference that, uh, uh, which brought together both the research people and some of the IBM people and a couple of people from universities at, at, a, at, a, at a workshop and, uh, to move it from what we could, were doing in, uh, wanted to do uh, on, in, in, in system Y, move that technology to product. So the move to California and the renaming it ACS was a was a move to product, and that's when Amdahl joined, came in. He hadn't been in research, and 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 uh, we moved out out here, and um, and the idea all along was it, it was to keep the core group very small. It would be and 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 be, frankly, independent of IBM. We we were subcontracted uh, about the. To Motorola, the chips, and uh, and and we subcontracted the compiler work that we had based upon what we what we had already done to um, uh, Computer Sciences in Southern California, and uh, we just subcontracted a lot of parts of it. Did a lot of analysis in addition, also for we did a lot of some great work on uh, branch prediction. And on caching, that was where a big, um, a lot of analysis was done on cache protocols and all of that. It was a, it was a single um, uh, in, 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 in instruction stream machine, one instruction counter, and um, but uh, it was really designed. And we had a lot of kernels that we worked with in order to validate uh, uh, the effectiveness of. of uh, of um, the proposed machine de designs uh, 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 through via a, a simulator. By the way, that the simulator. One, another great piece of work that John Cock did for for stretch for stretch and harvest was a simulator, and uh, and uh, he and another person, it may have been Harwood Harwood Kolsky, wrote that. Uh, I've forgotten. Who, who was who was involved? Whether it was John and Har Harwin, or if it was John and someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but, it, it would simulate the pipeline. Yeah, could simulate at the cycle at the at the minor cycle level mm -hmm. or major cycle level. So and uh, what uh, and the pi the pipelines and everything. So. Mm -hmm. So that. So what what were the major technologies that came out of that compiler work? Um, well, the, so the, the, you, you you were doing flow analysis then? Yeah, the the the, the it was um, control flow analysis mm -hmm. and uh, data flow analysis, and all of the the collection uh, catalog of, of, of optimizing transfer formations, and uh, and they were all in the and the theory behind them. So that and it was all, all done quite abstractly. And, but it did build on, on um, the first thing <laughs> on, on what we, on IBM work on, uh, or the, back, the Bacchus work on Fortran. They, because they had already identified the comp pieces of, the compi of, a, of a compiler that ex still exist today as distinct parts. The parser, they didn't, and the register allocator, the, the, the uh, control flow analyzer, the and uh, common sub-expression elimination as, as an example of, of one of the optimizations. And all of those are their terms. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it was, uh, so and, and it's, a lot has so been that was, that was the first thing you did at IBM, wasn't it? You were teaching the, yes. the Fortran? <laughs> teaching, teaching the scientists and research Fortran mm -hmm. to, so, 
Fortran. Uh, so that because there was going to be an edict that they had to use it. Uh, I came in the summer of, joined IBM in the summer of uh, 1957, and the Fortran compiler had been made available for use in April of 1957. So, mm -hmm. and, I, and the IBM research management decided that the, their own scientist had to use it. <laughs> had you worked with computers at all at U of M, or had you had an experience yes, with computers? Yes, I, I, I had taken a course in, in computing at, uh, at, and used a 650. Yeah. I'm just saying, going to IBM and then being thrown into the into the insides of Fortran compiler must have been daunting. Well, it wasn't so bad because I had because of the way that I learned to, to program on the 650. Because we first had to, you know, the usual way that it was being done at that time. You 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 code you coded at the hardware level almost, and then you would coded at a, a higher level. And, and then there was SOAP, <laughs> which is considered the highest level at that time, with, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. which was the highest did, level. Did you spend much time with the people that wrote Fortran? Um, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to understand how you, how you got to know the inside of the original Fortran compiler. Or just, um, just oh. what, 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 how, how you ended up in, yeah. in well, the, programming languages. The listings were, were, were available, easily mm -hmm. available. And, and the, the, though John uh, Backus and his group were not at IBM Research at that time, um, or they may have been at IBM Research, but in a different office, place. They were, but, um, but I remember, but one of the things that, that I remember at one point running Find, discovering what I thought was an error in the compiler, because it had collapsed a three um, three loops into one, and uh, and I thought, ah, oh, that's not right, you know. They, and, and, and we're looking at the assembly code from the original source, and uh, and it turned out that they had an optimization in their compiler that that was that has never been done or almost never done been done since, is that they recognized. The, that the way the data was stored, you know, it was a, it was a three-dimensional rate ma matrix, and the way the way it was stored would would and the, the fact that they knew the size of the, uh, of the, the the each component of the matrix that they could just go through storage from front in, with one loop. So, but so it was, was a nested three deep, so you could just flatten it. Flatten it. Yeah, but it was, it's the storage layout, and and knowing that exactly what, that it w looked at all the data, <laughs> and that so so that was um, I mean that I was, <laughs> and then from seeing that and looking back into it, I, also that people were just reading code at that time. The another project I was involved with at the same little right afterwards I think was in look. I ended up reading Roy Nutt's code on, on um, for um, for an assembler on the 704. Mm, the uh, FAP. Yeah, the mm -hmm. FAP. Yeah, and that's one of the ways I you know uh, often learned programming was to really look at great code. That's the way I like to do. It. Always like to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. People still do that today. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Find a great code or borrow his code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so that, here we are, kind of at the in the middle of ACS. Or. Yes, and then uh, and then the project got canceled, as uh, is well known. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think it, it I've uh, which was a really really distressing, you know, it was really kind of. Uh, but it, in retrospect. Uh, it was. I don't see how, why, why they let us go as long as we did, in part because it was. An, we had, the company had poured all of its resources onto 360, and and you know, of course it came out in '64, and then, and then, and everything was focused on that, and it, you know, and and it had to be, and uh, and we were running very counter to that. We were. 
the, to the 360 in every way. Mm -hmm. It was not instruction sets compatible whatsoever. And, um, and it was, uh, and we, we were using, going uh, outside to get the technologies. And, um, and, uh, and to the, and it was going to be a very costly, you know, as, as any high performance system is. Um, it's very hard to get payback, huh, for, in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. And IBM is, you know, did, over the years have sometimes gone in and out of being interested in high performance computing. Fortunately, they're in it big time now, I, mm -hmm. I guess, mm -hmm. but, uh, it's but then they, they had the problem in the early 70s that they had no competitive machines. Yeah, yeah, right. That's right. Mm. Yeah, that's right. But so it was, it was a tremendous blow to, uh, to all of us. And what I did <laughs> was, um, so it, it was much less of a one for me because, it, first of all, it was in the software and I could, was just happy to go back to New York. And, but but I, I used that little period there to write up what we, the compiler work, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that has served, uh, served everybody well. You know, John did too. Well, John, doesn't, John never wrote, but so we did, took care of that, for, you know, getting his, uh, some of his ideas on, on, uh, written up. Mm -hmm. So then, so then, you, then you come back in '67, '68. It was. I actually came back. Uh, I I actually was worked for Gene Amdahl for a year. I tried to to to. Gene then got the three the ACS three hundred and sixty mm -hmm. going, um, and I w w was reluctant to let the compiler work die, and uh, and so I. Um, got the head of uh, in, 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 in co of com compiler work in, I, in IBM, who was located in New York at Time Life Building at that time, and um, and, and convinced him that uh, that that the, the work should go on, you know, and uh, and that we could work on it and on the ACS 360 project and stay out here. And um, but you know that all kind of cratered after a while, so. Uh, and uh, but that was a nice period because again it was a period of trying to take what we had, what we what we what we knew was good. We had a lot of timings timings uh, uh, to prove it that on, on the, and 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 it was a, a new a lot of new technologies in those compilers and in, in the in the work and to try to move it again to product. What I what I have. Always, always liked is is working on both sides of, of doing the kind of theoretical work, uh, and but proving it in the product, it, getting it to products. So, and repeatedly, it's been mm -hmm. that aspect of the work that I've enjoyed most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how did you finally push that technology into the product compilers? I was here. You were. You were you were in California, and all the compiler work was being done in the east. Mm -hmm. uh, did that happen when you moved east again, or? Uh, in it's yes. In but I took a I took a, a sabbatical then, the first of two sabbaticals I've taken, mm -hmm. and and I went to NYU, mm -hmm. and um, and where there was a lot of compiler work going, going on there, and then returned to research, uh, IBM Research. And um, got a, a, the a, um, a, I, I decided there's I decided I wanted to use the compiler technologies to make building compilers simpler. You know, this has always been an intriguing question, and <laughs> since the, the the mid 50s about compiler compilers and and and, and that kind of thing. And so, I um, started a pro had a project on. Um, on that, on, on uh, and I, I also called it the experimental compiler, but it was a compiler compiler, and the target was uh, going to be was um, was PL1. Unfortunately, if I'd taken something a simpler language, it probably could have been quite successful. Mm -hmm. 
but it, it still was, is still referenced today. The work that the people in the group did is still, is, is still held up as, as advancing. Uh, I was, could clearly see that it was, that PL1 was early on, that PL1 was going to be too difficult to build a compiler for PL1 out of using PL1 in a system that actually constructed itself out of, of basic um, uh, definitions of right down at what is, the, what is a floating point operation doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, you put together that kind of thing. But, but hey, there were some good theoretical people on that, that uh, Larry Carter and Bill Harrison that uh, have, um, have pushed a lot of that f much further than I was willing to at the time because I didn't see the could, could see that we were in going to be in trouble with the, with the with the real practical issues. So, so then and then I went from from, from there to a couple of other uh, some some other work, all of it related to compilers and mostly related to getting compilers into IBM products. I worked on a, I had a PL1 project going with um, a, a company doing a PL1 uh, uh, optimizing compiler for the laboratories, the laboratory out here, um, for um, w working with Intermetrics in Boston uh, on it, and uh, and then doing some uh, some vectorization work. And so moving around and, you, and did getting. Did you have any involvement with Intermetrics and Hal S or the the space shuttle? Work. That had happened before. The Hal S had happened before. I was up there at the time when mm -hmm. um, they ha there was a problem with. Wasn't that the one with the problem? The space shuttle that had a a, a computer prob problem in flight. I remember where, where which were the two, three computers oh, they, they on board. Disagreed. Yeah, yeah. disagreed. <laughs> it was fairly early on. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I remember a lot of discussions on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they were, that was a good group. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, so then, kind of, kind yeah. of in the, it gets kind of in the, we're, we're sort of in the future systems time frame now. Uh -huh. yes. So yeah. I guess you had some work in future systems or? Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> now there's a topic. <laughs> That's true, I've kind of like switched flipped over future systems. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I was involved with future systems for a short time. I, that's right, that was the first thing I think I did when I got back from, from NYU, was future system, was got assigned to the, got into the future systems group. And, and I, and, uh, and in, the, in the compiler, and, and, and realized very quickly that it wasn't going to work, <laughs> and uh, and wrote a, a letter. So what what part of it didn't you think would work? Oh, it, in order to be able to access something from memory, it took two or three accesses, because it was it was the the interface with the machine was essentially kind of like an abstract machine of some sort. So you had to if you had we're talking about a, a sub i. Then you had to access I, <laughs> to and then, and then use that value to access A sub I. So it was it was it was uh, two round trips to memory, to storage in order to be able to get a, a, a data datum that you wanted, mm -hmm. as at the minimum, anything unless it was constant or something. So, and that's all. That's where the the bottleneck is. It's always it's always been there, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and in in performance systems, and uh, and so um, it goes back. I discovered recently that bottleneck was known to Turing, <laughs> and 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 so I wrote a uh, a letter to an, a memo saying um, that the, the it wasn't going to work, and I'd already had talked to. One of the managers, who kept, uh, and actually he was the head ar head architect on it, 
who kept the architecture on sheets of yellow paper in his bottom drawer of his desk for months. And, and, and whenever you had a, a, found a problem, I would find, find say, well, it won't, this won't work for COBOL. You know, he would come up with a different, different answer. It's all incompatible. It was a mess. And so I finally wrote him a letter and, and saying uh, to the overall person, saying it's not going not to work, and cited that particular memory bandwidth problem that, that, that there was just being mm -hmm. exacerbated he, by the... He had no performance analysis people working for him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, th and this was going to be the future after the 360. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And it was, and it tied up IBMers around the world. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a small mm -hmm. project. And nobody, nobody knows how much money it wasted, but it certainly wasted a lot of opportunities in that period. And so, but I got shelled for a, at least, a, I didn't get any raises for a couple of years. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but I, uh, mm -hmm. I... Meanwhile, John is often building 801. Um, I, just, I don't know what the timing, the timing yeah, so there was. But John... 801 is what, mid-70s? Y yes, yeah. the mid-70s. But Don, John uh, was on a couple of other projects in there. One I haven't been able to find out much about. Mm -hmm. Some people out here know about it. Um, it, it, had to have it had to do with telephone switching. Uh, John was always interested in that, among as many things. As, mm -hmm. So it's, it was a tel and it's signal processing system was another thing. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the, 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 uh, what John decided, the, the motive, John, what John took on as another goal, instead of the fastest machines in the world, machine being, working on it, he, his goal became the, the, um, the best cost performance machine, instead of the highest performance, just the cost performance. And that's what, what drove along with his ex experience in the early ones, the, the, um, what led to the PowerPC. And, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, which was, and it was, again, you know, it was also tied, they built the compiler first, and you know, it was uh, very, very nicely done. And I think if they, they had all, all also designed a language, they, a variant, uh, a cut down variant appeal, PL1, it was called PL.8, and um, that machine, uh, that la language solved some of the big, um, solved some of the uh, pointer problems in PL1 and the interrupt, uh, interrupt handling problems. And, uh, and, I, and I think if IBM had, had, had uh, published that language, made it public, it didn't. Uh, which was a terrible mistake. We might not have C today, which it is a terrible mistake. <laughs> so, uh, so, but uh, I don't know. You know, one doesn't know. But it was very unfortunate that that language was not published. It could, it could, it was not available. For one thing, it could constrain uh, storage management problems to. To a, to a fixed space, for one thing. You, PL1 had a, you could just wander all over the st storage and with the, the, the pointers. And uh, with this one, you, ha you had to specify, if you were using a pointer-based data structures, you had to specify, a, a, allocate an area in which those, it would work, would be, would be but used. It, but it wasn't as uh, strictly typed as, as Modula or Mesa or no, no, yeah. yeah, but it was it was good. It was very good and very compilable. Could write, get, produce very very good code for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So were you involved in in any of the eight hundred one project no. or the spinoffs? No, no. I was that. It was that was the time when I was more interested in um, in getting in applying uh, the compiler technologies it on uh, in in an, in, an, in a different way. You know, rather than that project was oriented towards a machine tech you know, system, I was more interested in in moving the compiler technologies towards making towards um, better um, tools and 
and compiler compiler systems and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when when does the Toronto group get started? Uh, oh, they came, got started as a result of of moving uh, of the of moving the the, the 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 work the work on the PL point eight to um, to product oh, okay. to support the um, the, the uh, power PC, which was built in Austin. A bunch mm -hmm. of people went down to Austin, mm -hmm. and and another group worked very closely with the Toronto group. Yeah. And the so so now we're kind of moving moving into when you really got interested in working in parallels. Yes, yes, and that happened um, uh, in in um, I and, I and I don't know what, kind of what came first, but there was a um, a project at NYU, the Ultra Computer Project, uh, which had was two fifty six processors. Uh, Single instruction, multi-data machine, but uh, but separate processors, very and and uh, supported by DARPA, and a very fascinating early early SIMD parallel, and IBM and IBM was involved with building it, and but it was going to got cut back to uh, a lot, uh, and um, and I. Uh, and then it kept dragging on for the, that for quite a while, and the processor itself, the processors themselves, went from 256 to 64. So that way, we didn't have to build a big combining switch in the network that supported it, and and um, and and the processors became somewhat obsolete. But I did mm -hmm. was involved with the so compiler. So originally, for originally that. it was supposed to be a full crossbar. Yes. Oh. Okay. More, 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 more than a crossbar it was because of at 256 they really needed to have a I, I don't know how to describe it but a, but a uh, intermediate kind of staging area for where, where where so that it didn't go through the full crossbar yeah probably in there combining switch in the middle of that and I and I, and and my group um, did the did the compiler for that machine, which was, uh, that was a fun, fun project. And that, we worked with uh, the Toronto people. Yeah, yeah that was, a, but it, it, that didn't really go anywhere. But it, we learned a lot about uh, the state of the art and, and, uh, and parallelism. But also the other thing that happened is that one of our great visionaries, uh, Irving Ladowski Berger, uh, who is he? He really has just been able to nail what the next big thing is, <laughs> uh, and he realized he was heading computer science at IBM Research at the time, and he he realized that that IBM was nowhere in in parallel computing, in parallelism. We were very very late to the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it started of course in in, at, in my mind in Illinois, you know, the Iliac, Iliac and yeah. Iliac Four and the great work of Dave Cook and uh, his students, they, they put all the, that whole base of ideas in terms of practic practical ideas came out of there. Mm -hmm. Of course, there had been a lot of literature on it earlier, and good literature. Um, so, so he came, Irving asked me to start a, 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 a group on parallelism, compiling for parallels and parallel. And so, and, and I, um, and I'd already done some work with vectorization, um, mm -hmm. with some had this group. So had them. had the vector feature been released on on the XA by then? Or? Well, I think it probably had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that was about the only thing that yeah. IBM had was the vector. Yes, for a long time. That, and then we were late in that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gray was way ahead of us, and uh, so yeah. And, and so we did a lot of work on that. And I hired a group, a, just an absolutely fabulous group, and uh, and and uh, we did. It was, we got the name. It was Ptran Parallel Translation, and it was really a again a a, a big mo kind of module. We we built a, an experimental compiler, followed actually the 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 model of Dave Cook had of being able to have 
a, a, an ongoing compiling system that w that would that one could measure how f the effectiveness of of applying all kinds of t parallelization and analysis techniques to uh, to the uh, to programs in order to understand the, the value and how they interacted with each other, and mm -hmm. so the par so you know we didn't uh, we had uh, Cook's paraphrase compiler that was what he had used for his students, and uh, and just just a marvelous one. But we I hired a couple of his students, <laughs> and also you know hired some, some some great people, and and they they. It just took off, and I, the the way we worked on Ptrand was that we kept the the um, the algorithms turned out a huge a number of algorithms and and new new solutions to things everything from runtime scheduling to in a parallel environment to debugging in a parallel environment. I got somebody out of Wisconsin for that, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, and uh, and to Lots of program transformations and analysis techniques. And mm -hmm. To the and the there was a last cycle through, uh, through on that was it it it, um, it got it it um, the the core some of the core technologies from that we designed and built made their way into the into the Toronto system kind of yeah you know, through uh, a laboratory out here <laughs> so. So it was, you know, it's all, it's, it's, uh, and there's some really good, good work there. So, mm -hmm. so but, the, this was, know. this was across, across SIMD and uh, just symmetric processors? Or? No, across, uh, it, it, the last piece of work, which was done by, basically by a guy named Vivek Sakhar, who um, graduated from Stanford and worked for me, and then, um, uh, and then took a sabbatical at MIT, at MIT, came back and worked for me, worked in, at, in research, and then is now at Rice University. And he, he kind of ha has an uncanny ability to pull together nice algorithms and things into good you know, industrial strength systems. And, um, and work, he works you know, a lot of the people together. So, so what... Um, what um, it it is, wh what that system can do, uh, it came out of which came from it, is what is um, is find what it does is find find to the extent that an analysis system can uh, find all of the the maximal parallelism that e exists in a program to the extent that it can deduce it, uh, and then from that compose the 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 the, um, the cost the most cost effective configuration of parallelism mm -hmm. a configuration mm -hmm. of task mm -hmm. which takes into account uh, pipelines you know the the work that the, it, that the the overlaps that happen in just plain old as instruction streams mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as well and as the, the whatever other model you have Synchronization, decomposition. And, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we got uh, about another five minutes left. Okay. And I'll yeah. just, if there's just anything else you'd just like to talk about, it's kind of went full circle <laughs> from, from parallelism all the way through your career and then back to parallelism again. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, I think there's one last thing. Uh, I've always worked on the same problem. And it's a problem that I was inspired to work on uh, by by John Backus. It's the 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 that what that one that in on um, that the software that compilers should make um, users more productive and systems better performers. And it's the performance. We've often worked on the performance side, but not on the productivity side. Backus had that as far as Fortran. That was his goal. His two goals actually, for Fortran one, and and that's what we need today. We is we've given up 
by, in lots of ways on the productivity side in order, because we had to focus on the performance, the performance side. For lots and now of we have these gigantic systems that right. have more processing power than we can possibly use. Yeah. And that's why I am excited. One of the main reasons I'm excited about this new uh, micro multi-cores is that we're going to have to rethink some of that. Users can, uh, cannot get the per performance out of that. And neither can the software systems of today. We, we're, we're going to be dead on performance. Um, we're just going to trickle off. It's going to just flatten out at best. And, uh, and it's time to rethink both what we're doing with languages and how we express problems and how we get how, um, as well as how we then map, map the, the, the myriad of different forms of solutions to, to the capabilities of the machine. All righty. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.